Welcome to the Plant Breeding and Genomics Community of Practice webinar, How to Use Double Haploids to Improve Winter Wheat. My name is Heather Merck, and I'm the Content Coordinator for PBG and your host today. For those of you unfamiliar with the Plant Breeding and Genomics Community of Practice, also known as PBG, I invite you to explore our training resources at www.extension.org slash plant underscore breeding underscore genomics. I also invite you to subscribe to our newsletter, PBG News, and I've put a link to that up in the chat pod. And then I'll help you stay up to date with PBG webinars and news about other online content. During today's webinar, Drs. Bill Brzozowski and Melanie Cafe Tremel of South Dakota State University welcome us to their winter wheat breeding program. Please help me welcome today's presenters, Dr. Melanie Cafe Tremel and Dr. Bill Brzozowski. Dr. Cafe Tremel is a postdoc research associate within the Winter Wheat Breeding Program at South Dakota State University. She was hired in January as part of the Winter Cereal Sustainability in Action, abbreviated WCSIA. That is a mouthful. And this project was funded by Ducks Unlimited and Bayer Crop Science to implement the double haploid technology within the breeding program. Dr. Cafe Tremel received a PhD in Biological Sciences from South Dakota State University in 2010, an MS in Agronomy from the National Institute of Agronomy of Toulouse, ENSAT, France, in 2004, and a Bachelor of Science in Cell Biology and Physiology from the University of Sciences and Technology in Lille, France, in 2002. Uh as uh, Bill said, I was going to talk about the detail of the double haploid technique using uh, the wide uh, hybridization between uh, wheat and corn. Uh, so as far as my experience, uh, I started working on this project in January. So I'm still um, establishing and improving the protocol that I am using. And uh, I want to mention that as part of my learning, I went to visit the, um, the Winter Wheat Double Applied Laboratory from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and uh, that's been very helpful in helping me to improve the technique. So I wish to thank uh, Dr. Graf and uh, Jam Fuss for sharing their experience with me, and some of the tips that they gave me I used in improving the protocol. So to give you an overview, of the different steps. First, uh, we do a cross between uh, the wheat and uh, the corn. Uh, the corn pollen is going to fertilize the wheat egg cell to produce an haploid embryo. Uh, an hormonal treatment needs to be done in order to produce seeds and the embryo. Then the first step is to rescue the embryo on a nutritive media to develop the haploid plantlet, and then the last step is to do a treatment with the chemical called chassis in order to double the chromosome number and uh, restore the diploid. So, how does, uh, do we obtain the haploid uh, plant? The corn pollen is able to fertilize the wheat egg cell. And, uh, but during the first few division cycle, the corn chromosomes are eliminated and are lost. It is uh, because the central nerve fails to attach to the wheat cell spindle microtubule, and so they are quickly uh, lost. Only the set from the wheat parent will remain, so we'll end up with uh, 21 chromosomes, an employed set from the wheat. Um, since there is not a normal fertilization, there's not going to be a normal endosperm, and the embryo will need uh, to be rescued if it was left as on the spike, it would abort. So it is placed on an intuitive media to regenerate into a haploid plant. So, and the last step is to treat with colchicine and so to 
produce a plant that is completely homozygous and uh, a double haploid. So now I'm going to go over the first step of the white crosses. The which genotype that I use can be at the F1 or F2 stages. We're working with F2, let more opportunity for recombination even to occur, but it requires an additional knowledge cycle. So we are using here both F1 and F2s. But there is a little bit of planning that needs to be done when you start working with a double haploid. The mesculation, the pollination, the embryo rescue process are all time consuming. So the wheat planting needs to be uh, staggered so that not all the spikes are ready uh, at the same time and to spread out the workload. The growing environment is important too and can impact the efficiency uh, of the method you're more likely to obtain better embryo formation from LP plant. And um, it, uh, having a temperature that is not too high uh, will be important in promoting tillering. And that's especially important when you work with F1 that you may not have a lot of seed to work with. Since uh, the wheat pollen is, uh, since uh, wheat is pollinated with corn, you need to synchronize your pollen production with your wheat synthesis. Uh, if you have uh, two environments, like two greenhouse, one to grow your corn, one to grow your wheat, you can adjust temperature to help with the synchronization. But if you are working uh, with both corn and wheat in the same environment, that's what we do. Uh, it, the synchronization can be achieved relatively easily by planting corn frequently. Uh, in our case, we plant uh, four parts of corn every twice a week and that ensure constant uh, pollen uh, availability. As far as uh, different uh, corn genome type to be used, there are some studies that have shown that there is an, an influence of the corn genotype on the success of the method, but there is also others that have uh, that there was no difference. Uh, I think in any case, there are some corn genotype that are more appropriate to use for the double double production. Um, first, take uh, have a short time between uh, the planting to the pollen production. Uh, the one that we use at around uh, 60 days. Um, it is better that they produce a large amount of uh, pollen for an extended period of time. And uh, also, um, genotypes that are not too tall and would be more practical. The sweet corn genotypes are relatively well sweetened. The emasculation is more critical uh, than in normal wheat by wheat crosses. It is better to emasculate um, closer to antheses and to limit the damage to the stigma and uh, to, to avoid it to dry. Uh, here we are not concerned with uh, self-seed since uh, it will be easily differentiated between self-seed and haploid seed since the haploid seed uh, don't have an endosperm. The top and bottom spikelet are removed, the middle spikelet uh, floret is removed as well. Um, minimal cutting of the gloom is recommended. Um, letting the gloom intact appear to even work better in protected WHC seed uh, when it's developing. Uh, for the pollination, the readiness of the stigma and the viability of the corn is um, of the corn pollen is essential for a successful uh, fertilization. It is usually be done uh, on the day of antithesis when the stigma becomes feathery and is very receptive. Uh, we usually try to emasculate one day before antithesis and we do the pollination on the day after emasculation. Uh, it is important so, to make sure that you're collecting uh, fresh pollen 
And uh, for that, uh, at the beginning of the day, the old hunter are removed from the tassels, and only the new hunter that appear are collected, and those hunter can be shaken in a petri dish to release the fresh pollen, and only the fresh pollen is used. Fresh pollen is light in yellow in color. If it uh, becomes darker yellow, then uh, it is discarded and new pollen is collected. And so, the, for to do the pollination, the pollen is sprinkled over the stigma with a fine brush. The environmental uh, condition during a post-pollination are also uh, important. Um, here I'm reporting uh, uh, work by Campbell was evaluated the free day and night temperature regimen. And I can see that actually there is a mistake on that slide. Well, the, the free regimen that they did were well, 17 during the day and 12 degrees Celsius during the night, not 22. But by comparing those different uh, temperature regimens, they find that the highest embryo uh, formation was obtained when there was 22 degrees during the day and 17 degrees during the night. They also showed that there was an, an influence of the light and density. So relative humidity plays also a, a role and can impact the embryo formation. It is mostly um, important when you are working with the detached Tyler method where the Tyler are cut and placed um, in solution. Now the second step, the hormone treatment. It is required um, to be able to set seed and uh, to let the embryo develop. Uh, it is, there is different auxin that have been tested and the most used is the 240. It is often applied at a concentration of 100 ppm, but uh, there was also a report that Dicamba was uh, also work relatively well, and uh, but it is usually used at a lower concentration. There are several methods of application. The solution can be applied by spraying uh, the spike with the hormone solution, by dipping the spike into the solution, or by injecting uh, the solution into the top internal node with a syringe, or the detached tailor technique as I told earlier, where the cut tailor is put into the solution containing 2,4-D. Uh, we are using here uh, the spraying technique, it is quick, and uh, we do it uh, one day after pollination. Uh, the detached tailor technique uh, uh, could have some interest in order to save uh, space and time, so we are considering it. The third um, step is the embryo rescue. So we are uh, cut the spike around 14, uh, 15 days after pollination. And here you can uh, see uh, some haploid uh, seeds. And uh, with the difference with uh, cutting the gloom or not, um, when we cut the gloom, we had uh, a lot drier seeds. The haploid seeds stayed uh, more green by letting the gloom intact. As, uh, Self seed and the upload seed can be easily differentiated by um, the self seed is bigger and of course it has uh, an understanding in comparison to the upload seed. So it's done about 14 to 15 days um, and if you go uh, too uh, early, the embryo may be too small uh, to visualize and if you lay too long, um, it could be already, the seed could be already aborted, but also on the practical side, if the embryo is too big, you may risk to damage it more during the embryo rescue process. It is done uh, under a sterile condition, so you need uh, to work under a laminar flow cabinet and under a stereo microscope. 
uh, the haploid seed needs to be surface sterilized and usually uh, we use alcohol and bleach and we rinse uh, with water. Stronger the sterilization protocol, the less contamination, but uh, if uh, the sterilization is too stringent, it may kill and uh, decrease the embryo regeneration frequency. So balance needs to be achieved. Um, Here are the, how the embryo look like, and you can see that all those haploid seeds do not have an endosperm. Um, but uh, not all the seeds will have an embryo, but all the seeds need to be open to, to find the embryo. The embryo is put, placed uh, on a nutritive media, and the most commonly used are Gambors media, or Murashi-Descoug. Uh, we use the both media. Um, it seems uh, for our primary result that uh, with the Gumbos media, uh, the roots uh, develop faster than on the Murashi-Descoug that was uh, supplemented with hormone, kinetin, and uh, IHA, but um, this is primary result. After um, the embryo is placed on the media, it is placed in a fridge at 4 degrees Celsius in the dark to break dormancy for 5 to 7 days. Then it is moved to a dark cabinet at room temperature until it germinates. If it doesn't germinate within 10 days, it is placed back into the fridge and uh, for about uh, 7 to 7 days and then taken again in the Cabinet. If it didn't uh, um, germinate within six weeks, we discard it. Once it germinates, and usually it happens within two weeks, it is placed under uh, at room temperature on a shelving equipped with light uh, for 16 hours of light during the day and eight hours of dark. Um, not all the embryo will be able to, ger to germinate. Here are some plantlets uh, that germinate, and uh, sometimes you may have some uh, embryo will not germinate at all. Some that form colors, some that do only develop a root or only a shoot, so only a portion. You're gonna have some loss at that step. Now, since we are working with the winter wheat, we need a, a vernal vegetation period to be able for the wheat to produce the flour. Uh, the fertilization can be done once uh, it has been transplanted into soil, the plantlet. Uh, the advantage is that you don't have further risk of contamination and uh, you can, the plant can develop better, but um, the advantage to use tube is that you, less space is right, required and that's what uh, we are doing. Then uh, the colchicine treatment. The colchicine treatment uh, interferes with the microtubule organization and inhibits uh, normal chromosome separation during the mitosis. So you will re it results with two sets of uh, two exact copies of the, each chromosome. And that treatment is usually done at the four to five tiller stage. Here is a picture, and the following picture as well have been taken in Canada, where they have equipped um, their um, fume hood with a large um, uh, sink, so it can accommodate and do treat a lot of plants at the same time. Um, it is, since colchicine is really toxic, it needs to be done under uh, fume hood. The roots are washed and uh, placed in beaker. The treatment colchicine is, of the concentration of the colchicine may vary um, from 0.05 to 0.2 percent. Uh, some DMSO can be used to help with the penetration of the colchicine to the tissue. Um, this is a harsh treatment, so some plants 
may not survive after um, the treatment, and but also some plants may not have been successfully doubled. It's going to take some time after transplanting back to soil for the new tiler to appear, but um, um, new tilers will set uh, a few seeds. So now, as far as the efficiency that you can expect, um, not all the embryo, uh, not all the seed will have embryo. You can expect about 20 to 30 embryo per 100 fluoride pollinated. Uh, you can expect that about 50 to 70 percent of the embryo will regenerate into a haploid plantlet, and uh, you can uh, expect about uh, 75 to 85 percent of uh, the haploid plant that will be successfully uh, doubled. So you have some loss at every step, and you, when you plan, you have to to uh, take that into consideration to to um, um, process enough florets in order to have enough uh, double haploid plants. Uh, here is um, a slide showing you the an, ex an estimation of the timing, but to from the planting of your donor plant to uh, the harvest of your double haploid seeds, and it takes about uh, 14 to 16 months uh, for winter wheat. And since you have the fertilization period, it would take less, uh, of course, with the spring wheat. Uh, to summarize, uh, um, um, this is definitely a technique that works and can be used in a breeding program, but it still uh, requires some optimization. And the optimization can be done whether uh, directly on the efficiency to increase uh, the, the number of embryo that you obtain, the number of haploid plants that regenerate, the number of uh, double haploid plants that uh, double successfully, but also on the aspect of saving time, since it's really time consuming, how uh, you can improve the technique to process a larger amount of uh, material at the same time. And uh, those optimization needs to be done uh, on um, each program individually based on the resources available, as a space, because you need to consider that at each stage you're going to need uh, some specific uh, greenhouse, the growth chamber equipment, um, on the resources available. And uh, so thank you uh, for listening. Uh, Dr. Garzonski and I uh, would be happy to answer your question.